think our AI engine was doing about, I want to say close to a thousand travel rule changes a day, just yeah. because governments were doing, right, 4 a.m., this changes and this changes and this changes. And we became RegTech overnight. So the word of the year for Xamna in 24 is distribution. We are actively engaging with partners who help us leverage what we've done at individual airlines level in a bigger scale. Meet Era Ariella Kai, the dynamic CEO of Xamna AI and Sunflower Relief. With two decades of experience in scaling data-driven startups, she's a visionary in venture fundraising, identity verification, and blockchain technology. Today, she's driving innovation in both the aviation and humanitarian sectors, making a global impact. You have to blame your parents effectively. I blame them for chopping and changing so much that it was very difficult for me to come into my own as a young adult but I also credit them for all of the skills I had to develop. Aviation security, you know, regulatory requirements mean in fact in Dubai we used to have two lines of passport checks three meters apart because for certain destinations like the UK there was just a requirement for very high integrity data. So Xamna just mechanized all of this. Our AI is a lot better than multiple humans doing the checks. Welcome back, everyone, to the Flying High Club podcast. Uh, we are now nearing the end of season one, and what a season it's been. Uh, we are now 10 episodes deep, and it's all thanks to you. Your following, your support, your messages have been amazing. And thank you to all the guests that have come and made this journey amazing. We've told you on the last podcast the great news that we have. We are going to season two, and we are going worldwide. We'll be out in Dubai shooting podcasts from there to cover the, the region of the Middle East and Asia. And we're kicking things off in London as well with a very, very interesting series coming up. So keep your eyes peeled for that. We'll also be at the World Aviation Festival in October in Amsterdam. Be sure to visit us if you are, are coming there. We'll be shooting the podcast live. Um, you would see uh, the clip below to check out our last uh, podcast to, to meet Danny Boyle, who is the GM for Terrapin, who is making this all happen. So a huge shout out to World Aviation Festival. If you haven't got your tickets, there is a link below in the description. Use the discount code of FHC15 for 15% off and use the link below. And we look forward to seeing you there. And again, not forgetting our partners who have helped us, eSIM Go, who have made this podcast a reality. We thank you again, again. Their link is in the description and you can even use a discount on eSIMS below. Click the link and uh, explore. But to today's episode, we've given this platform to a multitude of people. We, Our job is to provide you the experience, the conversation and the insight of what, what makes up the world of aviation. I go through tons of emails, tons of people, loads of meetings, and very rarely do I get to meet such an energetic an amazing person like I've discovered today and who's here with me. Smiling away in the background, she's the founder of Zamna, a blockchain-based uh, authentication stroke uh, verification platform. She was gonna tell us more details. It's one of the most amazing conversations I've had trying to get her on. And it's someone who deserves this platform to tell the story because I think she can inspire a generation of entrepreneurs to really encourage them to come and disrupt this space in travel and aviation, but just send good vibes and good energy to you and encourage you to go and create something great and on your own. Uh, it's uh, Ira, everybody. Thank you very much for coming, Ira. Thank you, thank you. Oh, good it's amazing here. to have you. We and made I, it happen. <laughs> we made it happen. And there's an interesting story which we're going to come to because when I launched this podcast, you were the one of the first people I reached out to. And there's a reason behind that and probably a, the episode will tell why. <laughs> but um, there was the one unique thing that we do about this is this studio we and the production. That was the unique selling point. And I didn't want to do things on Zoom. The first reply I got from her was, can we do this on Zoom? And I'm like, oh, no, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not moving away from our principles. Sorry, no. And then everything went quiet. And then, lo and behold, came the opportunity. But there was a reason behind that. There was. I actually believe in, unsurprisingly, running a data privacy company. I believe in personal privacy. And as a leader who happens to be female, blonde, fairly young looking, even though I'm in my 40s, 
I'm very mindful of keeping things public versus private. And I wasn't telling anyone at the time because things were on Zoom. But actually below the waist, I was growing baby number five. <laughs> and so I said to Raza, hey, I've had baby number five. I'm mobile now. I can go on your podcast. I can move. And because then at it the all time, makes sense. At the time, I was like in third trimester, huge, not really able to travel at all. It was that time where you just think, I can think, but I can't move anymore. And waist up, I was still working. Waist down, nothing was happening so we made it happen after all that time ah, it's amazing to have you so so welcome and yeah no i i don't even think the intro has done you justice to be honest and this conversation will bring all that out and it's so amazing to have you and it, it's so key to highlight the great personalities that sort of make up this aviation space to mm. inspire the next generation but to enthuse the current mm. to see what's out there those people out there and people who can relate to it. And you are our first female on the podcast. It's mm. not for the want of trying. We've definitely tried. But I didn't know you, that. You are, I'm are, honored. That's you great. Are. And let's make this go. We I want like to it. we want more and more. So if you're interesting, please reach out. We have again, like I said, stories to tell and challenges to tackle. We want to talk about those issues uh that are deeply rooted in, in this industry as well. Mm. And we want to unpick that and we want to smash that glass ceiling mm. for everyone that wants to become anything in this space. So, yeah, that's one reason I definitely wanted to have you on. But where I want to start is, Eri, your background and your upbringing. Mm. You have this way with people and this way of talking, this huge energy that wins. once in five minutes of conversation, you are enthralled and you are captivated. <laughs> this is a, you know, this is that's a personality trait that, you know, not everyone has. It's a skill. It's an art. But, you know, tell me about growing up and, and your background, the, the beginnings that you came from. And then where where you how you got the buzz for sort of disrupting and travel and, and all, all that? I think the ability to connect with people comes from a very sad childhood that I had, moving around countries an awful lot. And this was before we had phones, before we had social media. I would come and make some friends in one country. And then the next year, my parents who were academics would move to another country to teach at another place. And I would lose my entire life. I would lose the language that I'd just spent a year learning. I would lose my friends and my connections. So it was actually a really sad and lonely childhood because it means you couldn't take your friendships and relationships with you in a way that we can today in our pocket. But what it also means that as a child growing up in this way, moving from Ukraine around different countries in Europe, you figure out very fast, who can I connect with meaningfully? And who is my tribe? Who's going to help me get through some really difficult stuff? Like school is hard enough without having to move around and lose, losing your friends. So I genuinely credit my awful, unsettled upbringing with the ability to very quickly figure out, are you a human being I can, can connect with? And if you can connect with me, then, you know, can I create some sort of a meaningful and also fun relationship out of this? Because, you know, alone is alone and no one wants that. So, um, yeah, growing up was really, really different than most people, I'd say. I really missed my family back home in Ukraine. I miss them a lot now because all of my family and actually my dad went back to Ukraine. So everyone is back in Ukraine and I can't visit. My husband jokes that I'm not leaving him with five children if I go and visit an active war zone. And of course, much as I smile about it and I respect my family's decision to stay there, it's been a really hard two and a half years. And at one point I couldn't bring myself to care enough about I work with airlines and I took a couple of months off. Um, I had to grieve quite a lot when somebody very close to me got, got killed in the action. And it's just been really, really sad for a couple of years. And I think what's really important to highlight growing up in this sort of moving and reconnecting with people and very quickly figuring out who you are, how you fit in. I think the number one thing that's kept me going, especially since the war in Ukraine started, is the work that I'm doing and my team and the clients we work with because that's the creative process of creating something from nothing, putting it out into the wild and then getting this positive feedback. Not all of it, of course, positive in itself, but it's a positive loop of human feedback that you can then build on and do more. And I think in the face of the destruction of the last two and a half years, the creativity and the building of something for Zamna as a business, that's been a really important balance for me. And that's kind of a very roundabout way of saying how, you know, background to now connects. So, uh, I mean, there's, again, hundreds of things to unpack there. And, and and this, so this, this is, look, again, in the background, you don't realize, but 
travel and aviation played a part in you Huge. taking you around. And, and people forget that, you know, the, the impact travel and aviation has on GDP, it has on enriching lives and education because mm. people's families move and they take their children with them. And mm. that is in, enriching but challenging itself. So mm. you, were, you were born in Ukraine and where was the sort of first place that you headed off to? Um, Poland. Poland, Poland next door, then Slovakia, then Germany. I actually know that I was in Germany in 94 to 95. It was around the time that Lion King came out. And so I know all of the Lion King songs in German. Oh, wow. <laughs> I thought it was a German cartoon. And I still can sing the German song. So instead of, can you feel the love tonight? I'll sing, ganz das wirklich liebe sein. <laughs> like I actually think of German language as Lion King language because that's the year so we lived in Germany. So you're changing the audience. Your Netflix I am. And... <laughs> I am. I am definitely a very strange mother to to my five children who just kind of look at me like, why is she singing another language? Um, then we were in France for a bit. Um, Spain. I speak Spanish at home to my kids so that they can learn it. And then we came to England, and that's it. We hit the Atlantic seaboard. We didn't go further. One of my aunts actually did go further. She ended up in New York. But you know, go west was very much a mentality that people in Eastern Europe who were educated and who were fearful for the future, understandably, after the fall of the Soviet Union. They had that kind of go west mentality. And if you could get out, you did get out. Um, we have a very mixed heritage in my family. Um, I have some Jewish ancestry, which also was very dangerous to have at the time. In fact, any identity that was other than communist, which was the religion that was acceptable, was very, very threatening to anyone and independence of thought was not welcomed. So there were certain books that growing up, my parents would say, don't tell people we have those books. Don't tell people that we have, you know, Western records that we used to play or that you're learning English at home, reading these English books. And so it was an atmosphere of everything is okay and acceptable in terms of education at home, but you have to filter yourself on the outside. And just coming back to what you said about uh, women, I think, either minorities ethnically or females or quite frankly anyone that's not male pale and from Yale as I like <laughs> to say it if you're not male pale and from Yale you have to work twice as hard at least to get half the respect and wow. attention it is what I, I'm observing so I don't know if that's been your experience as well but that is pretty much what makes you just say right I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do more than anyone else yeah no I, I, and definitely and, and this is it's it's mechanisms like this that I've recently come about. That I've always felt that there's a glass ceiling, right? Yep. I come from a South Asian background, yep. son of an immigrant. Exactly. Um, so, you know, I've always thought there's only a glass ceiling. I can only do so much because that's what I've been taught. Mm. Schooling, everything. You can. Mm. Only, this is your limit. You work nine to five, you go home that's and mad. stuff. It was only, <laughs> I think, the, the age of social media, being having access to relatable people who are of similar age, mm -hmm same challenging background and hearing that they've made it well if they can do it i can't i can do it and one of the reasons i started this it was always a conversation i had with a number of people um in industry that i've worked with like great personalities to say you know what this this conversation only this coffee conversation we recorded it it'd be amazing loads of people would watch it I mean, like, no, no one wants to watch this stuff. No one wants to watch this stuff. Trust me, there is far worse people watch. And uh, <laughs> this would be entertainment for some. Um, but they were just like, well, well, why aren't you doing it? Why you? I just don't know how. I don't know. It was mm. always a don't know how. Because I was, again, mm. never taught that. That entrepreneurial mm. stuff, never taught how to do it. Mm. It was the use of social media. And it was people who are influencers that will give you little gems. And um, he's come on the previous episode. And I... I tell him all about it all the time his name's Mohammed Tahir he worked for Heathrow and he just started recording his journey as an engineer of planes landing I've seen that amazing I've yes, seen on TikTok. Mohammed yes, stuff he's, he is he's very amazing. very very watchable and entertaining and informative in a fun way but I saw someone from a South Asian background similar yep. to me same similar age How looks similar I'm like if he can do it, I can do it. And that was the step that it took. It. And that's what it needs. That's what I feel like. Someone may look at this episode and look at you and be like, hey, you know, because of this, I did this. Um, and we've had it. We've had someone reach out to us in LinkedIn and said, the episode you shot with your brother, 
there was one line in there I used it in an interview and I got a job. Oh. I, and now I've fulfilled. I've done my job. If I've changed one person's life it's or that. added some value then that's it. But this is what we want to get out there. It's that um, and so many people will be able to relate to your story of being movers around Europe, even going further um and being dragged along with their yeah. parents because you're carrying out their uh your their journey and then they're, they're, they're trying to do the best for you and they're imagining that they're doing it for the best for you but on the outside it looks like luxur- luxurious and amazing oh my god you're one of those families that moves around great you must have seen it's so much of the world very lonely because you lost everyone That's and it. actually to your point about your brother when i was out in dubai and i met your brother and we were doing stuff together i met a lot of people who enabled me and empowered me in fact it was men who empowered me in the middle east very unusually um to start doing more speaking and i used to genuinely shake one of your guests your former guest glen morgan will remember me as the throwing up girl because before i pitched him 11 years ago i threw up in the toilets of british airways because i just couldn't deal with being on stage i am still much more comfortable behind a screen and a computer than talking to people but when i was out in dubai uh, blockchain week dubai was happening all sorts of very novel at the time you know 5 6 years ago now half a decade ago ideas and it was your brother who introduced me to somebody in emirates who put me on stage something like every 2 weeks because oh. they wanted me to speak about what we were doing in dubai a lot more and what i realized then is you can't be what you can't see you just can't be what you can't see many years later after we'd done an agreement and a deal to work with the Arab Air Carriers Organization Arco who's also headed by a phenomenal man who is also a massive champion of women in a way that men need to be to address this imbalance um not because they're against men but because there's not enough of us being given the platform and the space to speak i came out for the arco event and he said to me now ira you know you're going to be talking in front of 400 people maybe more all of the heads of the middle eastern carriers who come for the arco ceo summit are going to be in one room in abu dhabi and i said what i really want is to bring three of my five children and the three oldest the girls because they can't be what they can't see yeah. and they were in the back of that room watching me on stage absolutely <laughs> palpitating but you know poker face trying not to show it had my tea beforehand had to do some breathing exercises but it meant more to me than just you know what my message was to these ceos in this wonderful room even with my champion on stage with me kind of supporting me and giving me that supportive energy it, it was terrifying but also really really important because there are my three young teenage daughters at the back taking inspiration from you and if i don't do it and if they can't see it they can't be it and that moment is still one of the most poignant moments and i owe abdul wahab farhad this experience that i had in Abu Dhabi my whole family was there even the baby was there in the pram outside not to make a noise but it was the three older girls watching me deliver the keynote um that was really important i learned some arabic for it as well i got someone to teach me how to introduce myself in arabic again you know to make an effort in in the lakati to try and connect with people in a meaningful way i still remember actually it was it's quite hard to that's, learn that's <laughs> I no i mean Yeah people don't do this like this is uh you know people will just you know either remain in their shell or again yeah it, it's a great 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 term of if you can't see it you you know you won't do can't it kind it. of thing you yeah. can't be it um That's what happened with you <laughs> Yeah yeah exactly that it, it is exactly that and and this is this is again the the, the reason why we're putting ourselves out there mm. to make that journey possible you can be what you want to be and there are people out there that are doing great things and are trying things take inspiration from that and and honestly it will unlock many doors. You know what? You and I have just had a full work day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've just come in here. We decided to put our heart and soul into this. This is effort actually. Yes, yeah, yeah. This right? Is... This is going to be even more effort behind the scenes that people won't see of you and Jamie and everyone editing and baking this work and putting it together. We really had to prep which to think about it. Why? Because this is how we put ourselves into the world. It, it is and it comes with so much benefit for yourselves but mm. for others you, because you feel like at this time I wish I had this in my time. This is true. Yeah. I wish I, I had do. this in my time. There's no there, one. There wasn't. There wasn't. <laughs> no. I had Cartoon TV. Like that was the, that's all that was available to me. Nothing wrong um, with Cartoon yeah. Network. <laughs> Love a bit of Cartoon uh, Network. But so there's a there's a there's a pretty like so it sounds challenging. So you're you're going through that as a child. Are mm. you you're learning multiple languages. You're you're learning to embed yourself in different cultures. Are you losing or building a personality at that point 
both at the same time. As soon as you have lost your identity as I'm part of this culture in this language space with my group of friends, it makes you question what you have left in yourself. And so a lot of it, what you have externally, especially as you become a young adult and as a teenager, which is when I was moving a lot, my primary school was all done in Ukraine. It was, I was nine, nine and a half when we started moving, sort of in American terms, middle school, secondary school. I think we are finding ourselves anyway, but that means we're finding much deeper what our values are, mm. not just who are my friends, what's cool, what's fashionable, but what are my values? What do I bring to the table and what do I need in re in return in a sort of transactional way? Mm. Because whether we're aware or not, everyone develops their own values, right? And you know, you and I actually after a few very quick conversations, like, oh wow, we're aligned on X, Y, Z. But that's because we're children of immigrants. We've done certain things. We're in the minority in most rooms we walk into. Um, and that does create certain strength as well. Yeah. But that strength comes from being very vulnerable and being in horrible situations. When, you know, my first day in a school where they spoke fluent English, it was in the Midlands and we just landed in the country. I remember somebody said to me, have you got the time? And I sort of freaked out. I was like, I have got time, but what do you want to do with my time? Because this is not how somebody asks for time in a classroom. We would learn, you know, it is five o'clock or whatever else, but the conversationality of it meant that you just feel constantly vulnerable and slightly under attack because you're not quite sure what's coming at you. Yeah. And this was a boy I really liked. And he asked me a simple question, have you got the time? And I just freaked out, I didn't know what to answer. And so obviously connecting with people when there's a language barrier is very, very hard. Working with our clients now, I am really mindful that I'm now in a privileged position. I can speak Spanish fluently to our Mexican clients or our clients in Spain. I can speak other languages to other clients. That's really a privilege now. But as you grow through that, it's really vulnerable, really lonely, and it's just very difficult because you can't quite get the measure of who you are to the people around you. And you can't figure out if you can connect. And that's that's really, it's really, really hard. And did that play a big factor in your sort of personality building the the challenges that you see and how you try to sort of accommodate for others is your upbringing yeah. and how challenging a different environment could be and how accommodating what well, you are <laughs> and, and friends you know friends i had who had to accommodate me i think that's what i want to be to others when i can because i think if you've been kind of on the floor and if you've been in a very solely lonely, sad space before, you have more compassion for others going through something. Or even, you know, as, a, as parents, we were talking earlier between you and I, how as parents there are certain challenges that you go through. And as a human being on a human level, they're really hard challenges. Yeah. They're, they, they crush you at some point. And you have to find the strength in yourself to regain that. And I think personality is just what we project outside given the, the values and the experiences that we've lived. And that projection only comes from what do I want to bring with me from everything I've experienced externally, because that becomes internalized and our personality is just what we then give out and put back into the world, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you've, you've, you've explored, uh, you've moved across all of Europe now, you've landed in the UK. Yep. And that's where you found now your sort of steady state. Yep. Talk to me about what were you planning at that age of what do you want to become? You have your aspirations. <laughs> was there a want of where you wanted to go or what you wanted to do? Oh, I was so, so, so keen to become an artist. I actually got offered a place at a university that I will not name, which was a wonderful university, it offered me a place to do art, fine art. And my parents said that's not a real subject. <laughs> being a daughter of immigrants, I had to get a proper degree with a proper job, like being a lawyer. So the negotiation there started, and this is my commercial hat on. I thought, I'll negotiate this. I don't have to take the first deal. I, I'm going to make a deal with them that, you know, I'll do history and then I'll do politics or I'll do law and I'll do a conversion. And I promise I'll do that. Of course, as I did my degree, I would leave <laughs> lectures to go and run to history of art lectures or to go and do fine art. And then I met uh, the folks at Oxford where I was privileged enough to win a place with um, just doing a stupid amount of A-levels. I did something 
seven, seven and a half, eight A levels instead wait, of three. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Hold on. Seven. I haven't done this. Yeah, yeah. I did. I did eight Four subjects. Four is plenty, by the way. Yeah, that, that's. Well, that's I was a weird child with no friends. Remember, so I had a lot of time. I would not recommend doing this. But my dream was to get into Oxford, despite having very bad English, not understanding you know, by GCC, what have you got the time means. So I was hell bent on doing whatever it took. And I just kept adding subjects and my teachers were very, very kind and saw that I was a really weird child on the spectrum who had absolutely no life. Um, I do have to say I made five very good girlfriends and we became a bit of a unit towards the end of my education. But as a result of not having a social life, I ended up being extremely into books. That was my comfort. That was my space of, well, I can control this in some way, right? Books can't be taken away when you cross borders, um, which is ironic because now I work with passports, which can't (laughs) be taken away when you cross borders. So, yeah, I did a lot of A-levels and I got an unconditional offer from Oxford and I ended up going and it was the biggest achievement of my life at the time. That's amazing. Only to learn when I arrived there that everyone else is smarter than me as you do at university. And um, number one thing I learned was that um, just getting a job or having a trajectory like our parents did was not the only way. I was one of the earliest, earliest founding members of Oxford University Entrepreneurs Club, which became known as OE, Oxford Entrepreneurs. Again, not many girls. I don't actually remember if we had any girls at, at that in that year. There was a handful of us. In fact, I'm pretty sure there was only one or two of us girls in it. But this really blew my mind. These people were talking about inviting Silicon Valley um, speakers to Oxford using the Oxford brand. And I, I remember, I think somebody from PayPal came. I can't remember who the first speaker I, I saw was, but I just thought they're building their own businesses. And it was then that I thought, well, wait, I can become the CEO that my parents want me to marry. I really, really didn't want to go down the Eastern European, I'm sure in certain countries there's like a, until you get married as a female especially, you're not accomplished. There's nothing wrong with marriage. I love my husband and I love my children. But this concept of creating an ownership of something was so exciting to me. I just thought, wow, this blew my mind. I am not gonna get a job. So I saw a speaker from New York called Janet Hansen. And she said that she'd started something for women entrepreneurs in the US who were on Wall Street. And um, I just came up to her after her speech. And um, I chatted with her and she said, do you want me to give you an internship? Come to New York and do this internship with me. And I thought, oh, the first ever female partner of Goldman Sachs wants me to come to New York and do an internship. And then I thought, wait, I'm broke. (laughs) I'm broke because I had to pay for Oxford myself. And so I hustled and I took jobs and I actually had a startup teaching dance to people. (laughs) That was my startup at the time. I taught dance to pay for my fees. I had a student loan, but I didn't have the bunk of mom and dad. My parents were poor immigrants. I actually remember them saying, good luck at Oxford. How are you going to pay your fees if you are going to accept this place? It was expensive. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was daunting. And I remember writing my own first check. student loans really existed to the level that they did. Exactly. And Oxford also doesn't allow you to have a job because you're meant to be studying so hard. And I was working something like 40 to 50 hour a week teaching dance to people. And I made a killing. And I realized there and then I couldn't work for anyone else. I mean, I mean, we got off track a bit, but <laughs> no, there's, a, there's, this is so relatable to so many people. The whole, the affordability, like you, you know, there are so many. It's I, expensive. I think it is. Um, yeah, it is. Education is expensive, and yeah. it's becoming more and more expensive. The fees are going up all the time. Private schools becoming more expensive now. Yep. That will, that will inevitably come. Not going into politics, but yeah, yeah. Um, but you know that sort of that education system is. It feels like it's being put out of reach. Yeah. For people. So they'll only remain at a certain level or deliberately being kept at that. I don't know. Don't mm-hmm. want to get into controversy, but mm-hmm. it's those people who'll be listening to the story and be like, oh, I can that's exactly how I feel, that relatability that I love that that, that story that you brought Do out. Do you remember there. we said two things. You can't be what you can't see and you sometimes have to be twice as good to get half the respect. I genuinely don't believe the word is the world is very fair or meritocratic it should be but it's not but if the world is unfair you can make it unfair in your favour so if you just go all out and do something stupid like doing eight A-levels 
then you are stacking the cards in your favour. It would be embarrassing I'll judge if Oxford... now on the A-levels now. If <laughs> the level of crazy... I did mention this was going to be a really interesting one. Eight A-levels. So let's go into this. At 16, Which ones? I just decided this. Um, so I did a lot of languages, unsurprisingly. Okay. I did four languages as my A-levels. And then um, I did art, obviously, because that was a dream to be an artist. Um, and I still... I will realise this. I picked up a brush for the first time in 17 years this weekend. As soon as I shipped my children off to summer camp, I thought I need to draw for my soul. So, yeah, four languages. Um, art, um, history, which I ended up doing at university, physics, psychology. And then we had to do something called general studies, yeah. which is like PSHE now. Yeah. yeah, those ones. Wow. Like... It's a, there's a busy busy schedule it's a busy schedule but there was nothing else going on you have to remember the lonely on the spectrum child so I've had this conversation with many of a friend uh, and stuff and we always look back like oh you know we should have done this maybe an education this and we're like yeah but do you really regret like I don't mind I used to bunk off some classes you know we had a lot of fun um, and did I put in my maximum effort no I got out okay landed in a great place could have done better but and then I was like, but that time of fun I had, other people were nailed down, unlocking, doing great, more A-levels, churning out those results. And then I do ask, do you think you missed out on a bit of your Massively. childhood there? Massively. A great time. For years, for years. Even my social life at university didn't really kind of feel natural to me until maybe the third or the fourth year. Um, in fact, my three-year degree took me four years because I struggled so much with uh, almost an identity crisis. And it's not even just missing out. You know, you have to blame your parents effectively. I blamed them for chopping and changing so much that it was very difficult for me to come into my own uh, as a young adult. Yeah. But I also credited them for all of the skills I had to develop to, quite frankly, survive those environments. I mean... I, yeah, I mean, you would have lost out on a lot of those moments and yeah. been torn between. But then again, if you didn't know any better, that that's that, all you know. Exactly, you just you know. get on with it. I do. I do think now with my children, I I don't push them at all. Even <laughs> I, I'm going to I'm going to just be honest and I say the entirety of primary school, I told my kids to not do homework. Because quite frankly, they need to be developing themselves in other ways. They've done eight hours of school in the day. If your homework's more than 20 minutes, you're not doing it. You've got music, you've got sport, you've got social activities. You need to be, I believe, more than just your books and studies. And I think that comes from me not having somebody give me that guidance. So we do become our own parents, I think, when we're growing up and we think, what would I fix with my childhood? I think this. And trying to, you know, almost not repeat the cycle of silliness or extremes like what I experienced. Wow. I mean, I, I, again, totally agree. I think childhood is so underrated. Let them play. Let yeah. them learn through Let play. Them Let, them, yeah, let them be kids. <laughs> let them be kids. And that, that life experience will mm. teach them more than possibly a book book will well i actually uh, had to take some of the kids out of school when i was working in dubai and working with your brother and i had to tell the schools well i won't see the children unless you let them come out of school for a week at a time <laughs> and we used to fly them out thank you airline who will not be named we used to fly them out thursday to sunday for obvious reasons because fridays was my day off saturday was my day off and then ship them back ship them out ship them back oh wow it so was you're... it was a, a bit of juggling so yeah. this, i want to get on to this now mm. so we'll come to the the entrepreneurial challenges as a female and a mum mm, of mm -hmm. raising those kids and, and raising a company at the mm. same time who becomes a new child in itself. Mm -hmm. But getting to that stage, so you, you've got to the university stage, you realise that entrepreneurial and building something for yourself and becoming your own CEO is a thing. Mm. What what next? What was your next stab? How did you go about it? Because this is an intrigue yeah. of so many that they have an idea, they've just had the spark. Yep. How did you convert? How did you go from there? The quick answer is that you don't. You end up wandering around clueless with some sort of multitudes of ideas. I'll re-say that. You're clueless because you have a lot of ideas and because you don't have a roadmap of whether one of them's more viable than another, whether you need to start with A, B or C. The 
first thing that was really helpful for me was meeting other people who were a little bit further down the road. And again, we're talking pre-social media. Facebook just started in 2006 as I'm graduating. People were poking and throwing sheeps at each other. At this stage, exactly. Yeah. We were, yeah. And the wall wasn't even a wall. Yeah. And Mark Zuckerberg would send out emails, emails apologizing for features that would breach our privacy. And it was just very interesting to hear what others are doing. And there are only two ways in which I ended up progressing because everyone is clueless. This is this is the thing with adults, right? You and I are seen as the adults. And actually, if you think, who made us the adults? We're still clueless. We sort of have to make it up <laughs> as we go along. Let's be honest. We are like professionals and we're established yeah, and we're in yeah. our 40s. And who am I to give advice to well, Exactly, yeah. exactly. But the reality is that it doesn't change when you're young. You just have more energy yeah. and you have more almost social forgiveness for failing especially now at the time there was a lot of pressure for me to get a proper job and not waste my oxford education and resisting that pressure and really tuning out those voices of should 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 get married have children you know have a proper job all of that still stands for so many young people yeah. coming out and graduating family pressure cultural pressure you name it social pressure whatever you want to say and i think tuning it out and really zoning into again what are my values what's important to me and who can I go and either work for to learn from them or how can I find a way or advisors who can help me build the roadmap that resonates with what I want to build and how I want to build it. Those were the two questions that really saw me through. So I had four different startups before Zamna in mobile space and data space and privacy space and they were really hard because I was brought on as a co-founder each time we had no idea what we were doing. I didn't know what fundraising was like. I didn't realize fundraising was the most important job of any leader because it's like the fuel in your car. You run out of fuel. That's it. Your party stops. Your car doesn't drive anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, something like making a deck, there was no YC awareness. You know, here's your top 10 slides that investors want. This wasn't available. It wasn't a space. It wasn't a developed. It wasn't at the time. And so we all kind of just bumbled along and London, the Silicon Roundabout didn't exist. Yeah. Um, the only office on that roundabout was um, Moo.com. It was the offices of Richard Moros and he gave a bunch of us desks to use. We didn't know what hot desking at the time was. But, you know, early companies that were coming out of Oxford, Imperial, Cambridge would all collate around those offices because from memory, it was pretty much the Moo offices giving us a working space that wasn't a cafe. So just on, they just created on that, that. The, the, so you said you were joining as co-founder and stuff like that. Was yeah. this from the university community and things like that? Because it, there's a... University community and London pre-Silicon Roundabout sort of early startup space. There's a network in London called ICE which um, I was the first woman in together with um, a wonderful woman who's now my oldest daughter's godmother. Uh, so we were the first two women in it. And we went on a ski trip, which at the time, you know, nobody was doing entrepreneurial ski trips. And actually everyone got quite happy on the ski trip and retrospectively named it ICE, which was what we saw on the strip. Yeah. And we retrofitted a really horrible name to it. It's a mouthful. International Conclave of Entrepreneurs. Oh there was no conclave. It wasn't international. <laughs> it was a bunch of children from London in their early to mid-20s who were all trying to build their own businesses. But on that first trip, it was a very tragic last day when we lost somebody oh. in a whiteout on the last day. And we were all trauma bonded because then we went to the funeral of this wonderful person who was actually the co-founder of Dolphin Music, a very early startup out of actually the northeast and um because we were all trying to do our own thing we created a kind of a chat and an email list with you know hey i need a lawyer to do this hey who's incorporated this hey who's got a tax advisor for this hey when are you hiring what are you doing with this hey i've got a candidate so it became like the very first network of clueless 20 somethings who were all trying to solve the same problems and could share resources mm -hmm. and that became a pivotal moment for me because i suddenly had information that was starting to answer questions before I came to those problem points. And, you know, pitch decks or VCs or reviewing somebody or networking space or hot desking, all of these things were starting to become the the terminology around that group of people. And um, one of my closest friends and now also my son's godfather 
um, David said to me, do you know what? You need to know that in the Silicon Valley, you haven't started your round until you've heard 200 no's. You haven't even started. Mm -hmm. And that, again, that's perspective that I didn't have. And so when we first started raising for Zamna, having me failed four times over and wasted other people's money, it's like free business school. But when we started fundraising for Zamna, my co-founder Alex and I had a sheet of about a thousand names. And guess how many no's we got to before we raised our first 750K? 200. More. More. Five. More. 820 something. <sighs> It wow. was brutal because we hadn't raised before. We hadn't, you know, I'd been a stay-at-home mom for a couple of years by that point. I had a two-year-old. I'd been out of the kind of network for a bit. It was just insane how much confidence I got just from people giving me perspective of what effort and relentlessness would be required to get there. Most people will, you know, think, well, I've got an idea. I've asked 20 people. They all said, no, I won't invest in it. They might give up after 20 times. Much as it's tried, you can't fail if you don't give up. But do you think this was at a period where look, VC and venture capital and stuff or, or money was, wasn't was so easily thrown around as such or it wasn't really a thing that it's become it, today, possibly? It wasn't as institutionalized yes. and okay. as process established that's not even a word to say it but i think you get what yeah, i'm yeah, yeah. coming at it was it was very early days which means actually both good and bad they didn't quite know how to assess us so with iag we were actually the wild card <laughs> we won a place in hangar 51 in 2016 <laughs> as a result of uh, glenn morgan and, and scotty saying they seem to have some crazy wild technology that might help us with identity, verification, scanning, whatever. Um, and we were the wild card. Nobody knew how to treat Zamna and what we were doing. But as a result, they said yes. So it's both good and bad. You're not sure, the ecosystem is not mature, but it means that there's more opportunity to come through, I think, as well. Less noise, there was less people mm. doing this. And actually now, just to conclude this, after COVID nuked the travel startup scene, the businesses that survived are clearly the ones doing something genuinely of value in the industry. Otherwise it would disappear, yeah. Right. We had a very fashionable wave of travel tech businesses before COVID. It just became like a thing. Anything and everything, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. You would have seen this as well, yeah, which yeah. which is both good and bad, but getting through this sort of recession or surviving a downturn, I think is also quite a healthy thing for the industry to go through. Yeah, 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 no. So, Zamna, now we've talked about it, co-founding it. What is Zamna? What does it do? And now tell me the challenges it addresses. Give me your startup pitch here, <laughs> on on here. What, talk us through, and then. But I want you to talk about behind the scenes, the creation of it. Where mm. did the idea come from? Mm. Is it one idea that was mixed with another idea? Was it mm. clear from the start? Oh God, or it was. You had to make four pivots in that time. It, yeah. That's that's another key thing that we want to share. That I think aviation is such a specific sector. Unless you've come from it you think that as an entrepreneur or technologist you could solve problems unless you spend years studying the space you won't have a clue <laughs> and you can't apply logic to airlines right no you can't <laughs> you cannot <laughs> so um we started off with a very different product to what we have today and i credit iag hangar 51 with an awful lot of work that we did in the early days in fact one of our best outcomes was during covid we hired our fantastic chief product officer out of BA, Raoul, who you'll know, and himself and so many others, including your brother in Dubai, we had to do the legwork to understand the entire industry, not just this is one airline and they say this, or this mm -hmm. is our assumption as external technologists that airlines need A, B, C, and D. Um, travel tech is a very, very complex space, and it's like any other specialized industry medicine has their own language you know the lawyers have their legalese <laughs> aviation has their own words their own bloody dictionary yeah. yep and everything is about tlas three letter acronyms or more right unless you start from a holistic understanding of the space you can't solve problems because you don't truly and deeply understand the problem space and we have spent the last 10 years in our venture back business really understanding that problem space hiring out of the industry as you well know and this is the only reason that I can sit here today and say that Zamna 
if you like standing in a queue, is not for you. <laughs> if you want the best check-in experience ever, none at all, then Xamna's your friend. And ultimately, every airline in the world now is doing scanning. They're trying to do scanning. But then so this what? is you scanning a document, right. sending it in advance. Right, right. And then, then what? And then oh, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then what? What happens next? And then what? You still have to queue and have some sort of a check in the airport because I could scan my sister's document and it's a good document, but without any of the travel context, without matching to your name, to your booking, to your journey, to your destination, to the travel rules that are applicable, which are different, of course, if it's you or one of my five children with different ages, without that travel context it's useless to the airline. Mm -hmm. And even if you had travel context and travel rules and the matching, but you can't update the DCS for the airline to actually benefit and realize the benefit, you're not making a change or any impact to the airline operation. So Zamna does all three. We do the documents and we can work with other scanning partners, but we do them in the travel context of your booking, the travel rules and the regulations for your specific nationality, age, and we then update it seamlessly into the DCS. So as a passenger, you shouldn't know about Zamna. You don't care what happens yeah. behind the scenes. You just want to travel. And that's what we deliver. So it is identity management. So you, in, in essence, enabling the, the constant checks of the passport at every turn and giving it to the man who looks at you and says, what are you here for? Stamp, that kind of, that stop, start, stop, start. But that tra travel journey becomes just this arduous stop-start process. You're turning it into, or aiding turning into a more seamless journey to where you're going. It's very important that the stop-start process has a point to it. Yeah. Aviation security will oh, tell you yeah. that, you know, regulatory requirements mean, in fact, in Dubai, we used to have two lines of passport checks, three meters apart. Because for certain destinations like the UK, there was just a requirement for very high integrity data and they were just throwing bodies at it. Most airlines have to throw bodies, bodies at, it, yeah. at this because if you have the wrong regulatory checks and you have in ads or you've got your landing rights impacted after a few transgressions. So Zamna just mechanized all of this. We automated. Our AI is a lot better than multiple humans doing the checks. But because we do it with the travel context, not just scanning or digitizing the data, we can also stand behind our decision. Mm -hmm. So at one point about, I'd say four years before COVID hit, we had to really think about insurance because if we give the wrong answer, we have to put our money where our mouth is, Zamna. Yeah. And we created what we call Zamna Guarantee in COVID because the airlines were struggling with the constant travel rule changes. Yep. If you remember at one point, I think our AI engine was doing about, I want to say close to a thousand travel rule changes a day, yeah, just yeah. because governments were doing, right, 4 a.m., this changes and this changes, this changes. And we became reg tech overnight. It's still important today. Rule changes are not as schizophrenic, but there is no digital travel rule engine. With mm. all respect to the current industry players, they're still about 20% digital. And those big paper books everyone has on the check-in counters are there for a reason. Yeah. So where there's a conditional, rather than an easy green, yes, you know, you're a Brit flying you with your British passport home, that's a very easy case. Where there's anything more complex than a, a national flying home or a need for visas, declarations, ETAs, e-visas, health checks, almost. anything like that, that's where Zamna really makes a difference because that's where the complexity doesn't need people doing it. The, the engine can do it much better than humans. And if we clear your passenger and say, hey, Raza, you're ready to fly to this obscure destination and all five, 10, 15 of your documents are in order. If we give that answer to the airline, we stand behind it. So any issues, any fines, we pick them up. And actually, I have to say, we've done this over 70 million times now. And wow. we have picked up this many fines because the precision of the engine means just if there is no perfect match, it defaults to the process as it is. Go to the airport, do it manually. But so my challenge to you on that one is you are one cog in a ton of wheels. Oh, God. so many stakeholders. You've got airports, you've got governments, you've got government officials, you've got immigration, you've got different parties, different. How does Zamna connect all of them? How do you as your small scale up business connect these behemoths of slow organizations conventionally, bring them together to, to do this? Because it's not your, you know, you're not creating these passports you're yeah. not in charge of that you know generally countries are how, <laughs> how do you tackle that 
I would love it if the governments of the world could come together and agree on a standard. standard. <laughs> and actually, if you think of like plugs, I don't know if we have a plug here. The governments can't even agree on a plug. You have to have different plug sockets. Yeah, yeah, I've got one in my bag. <laughs> You've got five faces. We actually do have one standard, which is the ICAO Electronic Machine Readable Travel Document Standard. Yep. That over 290, 300 and something countries do subscribe to. And so Zamna uses that standard as the key to all of the operations that we create. And we also start with a very focused solution for airline carriers because they are the ones with the liability. Yep. The border forces don't have to pay fines if they check their documents airlines incorrectly. Do. Only the airlines. Because ultimately... You know, this airlines are flying buses. They don't care if you and I have regulatory approval to go to a country. So they want to sell us sell us a seat on the flying bus. As long as you paid for your seat on the bus, on you go. They don't want to manage the data, orchestrate the data, check your identity, do any regulatory processes. And because they get so heavily penalized by it, Zamna's problem solution in that space has just been to follow the money. How do we save airlines literally millions? One of our clients in South America realized that just with one tax declaration that the passengers were not providing properly to the airline, they were losing $5 million a year in government fines locally. Wow. That's not even a regulatory thing. It's a declaration of some sort of a tax that was not happening. For Zamna, there's just another item to add into the digital engine that we provide the airlines, right? We hand it over. They run it on their premises and they're happy. They suddenly, Zamna's paid for itself. So we followed the money and we solved something that was very operationally present. Mm -hmm. It had a real life use case. It had real costs and real savings very, very quickly. And so you're, you, so where did this, so where did this idea come from? Mm. Was it yours? Was it something you saw or a, a, just sitting at the airport? <laughs> Where does that spark come from? And obviously the idea gets developed over time, which you mentioned, yep. going through an experience. And there's one thing that we want to call on because you call on for a lot of help yeah. from others yeah. to help that. And you're not afraid of admitting that, which is great because others are afraid to reach for help. But start off with the, where did the idea sort of come from? Was it personal experience or seeing the, the problem outside mm -hmm. from front or was it just an idea? It was a fascination with something that I actually drafted into a PhD I never finished. <laughs> I was very interested in data privacy. And the original um, name for Zamna was actually Digital DNA. <laughs> Around the time the DNA codification was completed, it was actually one of my stepfather's friends who was working on it, also at Oxford University. My stepfather still teaches there. And I was talking to him at dinner and I realized that our DNA, if we were to print it out and leave it on a bus, you wouldn't know whose DNA it no. is, but it would be intrinsically yours and no one else's. And that concept, because I studied physics, remember, and actually my biological father is a rocket physicist, literally made me feel <laughs> absolutely stupid <laughs> growing up. But I had a real curiosity of how specifically DNA data and identity data could be protected in a super encrypted way. That curiosity led to the first pattern that I co-wrote with my business partner, Alex. And Alex and I didn't found a start at Zamna until about a year into getting the response from the US Patent and Trade Office saying, hey, you guys actually have something real here. Our lawyer at the time called us and he was a friend. He said, you guys should sit down. This never happens normally. You'll try and patent something and you can't patent an idea, browser, yeah. right? Yeah. You've got to say this bit connects to this bit and this is the new bit. Yeah. Even though this bit has been done before, this is the new way of doing all of this. And we were told that the patent office was not coming back with any pushbacks, which was really quite unusual. And we then quit our jobs the next year and started to build Zamna around that first patent. And the idea of data privacy, data security, protecting personal data had nothing to do with airlines at the time. All of that was acquired knowledge, starting with Hangar 51. And we so, never looked back. <laughs> so now there's an interesting bit there. And this is where we differ as a podcast. Mm. You just mentioned it. You quit your job mm -hmm. to follow your mm. startup dream. Mm. Where does that decision making come? When do you make that choice? Mm. Is it a when that startup start making a certain X amount of revenue? Is there a life challenge where you've got enough savings to cover you for a certain period? 
it's a very deep and personal question. And, um, but it's a, a, a challenge loads of people will go through. Well, they'll have this side hustle start up. They'll have a corporate job supporting it. Yeah. When do you make the switch over? What goes through your mind? You've got children at this stage. Yep. You've got a family. Yep. Yep. You're a female. Will you be taking time out uh, during this period to raise you? How do you raise this business? Or do you take the back seat while you... All that goes into consider. Talk me through that process. I think there was absolutely zero consideration <laughs> at the time. I actually did something really stupid that I don't recommend. I maxed out so many credit cards. Ah, this, 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 this. No, my but this is common. People developers. do this. Yeah. But yes, yeah, be very careful and you shouldn't. I, but people do this. I, this is what I want to do. I had to. no idea how to raise finance at the time. I had no idea how to negotiate with lawyers to say, you know, carry some whip for me. I will pay you back in X. I didn't know what sweat equity was. I didn't have good advisors at the time. It was extremely challenging because I think when you're in your 20s, this is when you should be taking crazy risks. I had very limited resources. I was living in a bedsit with my daughter. I actually slept on a friend's floor at one point with her on a single mattress because I didn't care that I wasn't, you know, my family would be despairing. My grandmother was lied to that I'm doing another master's and that I'm not starting something stupid again, having failed four times over. Um, I don't know where that confidence came from. I was just really interested in the idea and developing it. And I would do quite literally whatever it takes. I don't have a fat home and I need to make sure that, you know, my daughter and I sleep on the mattress and then I hide it under a couch. No problem. I don't have an income and I'll just max out credit cards and I'll keep, you know, juggling multiple jobs. You don't stop your juggle. You know, I had to do part time jobs. I was doing whatever it took. I was ironing. I was cleaning houses. I was doing whatever it took. And manual was easier than my mind having to go off the topic of what then became that first patent. And while she slept, I would study or I would draft things. I had to really just juggle the hell out of it. This is not something that I probably could have done in my 40s. I had to do this in my 20s. And this sort of insanity that you look back on, at the time, all you can do is walk as far as you can see. And then by the time you get to that point, you'll see the other stuff, right? So maybe you have two years worth of savings. Well, those two years are a huge horizon. Maybe you have six months. So you give yourself some sort of time and a runway. Ultimately, I knew that my credit cards weren't infinite and my part-time jobs were not going to sustain quite a lot of, you know, runway. But you have to get to a point where you can see signs that this is the right direction. Mm -hmm. And those signs are not like astrology signs or something very intangible. It's either attracting talent or attracting money. Mm -hmm. Because that is the only thing that as a CEO, as a leader, you can do. You have to be a magnet for brilliant people and funding. And figuring out how to be a brilliant talent magnet and a magnet for funding is the only job I have as CEO. Literally to this day. That yeah. is my job. You put brilliant people in a room, you get out of their way and you fund them. That stuff progresses. It won't be straightforward. It'll take ebbs and flows. It'll be extremely complex at times. Maybe you'll come close to failing and you have to fail a couple of times or come close to be a really a startup worth its yeah. salt. But that is the, the thing that I kept going with. I didn't know that was what I was doing, but that was it. I mean, I'm blown away by by that commitment, that that bravery Look, I can't. Or just foolishness. Well, well, I don't yeah, think all I was the stupidity. Afraid. It was but, just um, naivety as well. It is, and and you know what? That youthful exuberance and naivety can sometimes be a gift. It can serve, yeah, and, yeah. and serve you well. Yeah. But sometimes it can really. But I am give still you paying off <laughs> so much debt. You would not believe it. <laughs> so yes, this is it. This is the hidden side I want to bring out. This is what I yeah, love. Yeah. This is brilliant. But you said a really key thing about step by step. Yes. And there's this great quote from a book and I, I'm trying to recall the title but I think it's The Boy, The Fox, The Horse and the, and mole. the mole. Yeah, I like the book. When the boy is riding and it's really dark in the 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 rain, uh, the, the forest as such. Yep. And um, Where are we going? Says, where are we going? Yeah. I, I don't know where we're going. Um, and then he gets told, can you see your next step? Yeah. Yes, I can. Just take, take that. that. 
I read that book to my kids every night. I love it. I've given that piece of advice to yes. to my children. I'd give it a, yep. to everyone. Where that becomes attributable is relate it back to the story you just heard. It is, I know there's something there. Let me just do this paper. Let yep. me just do this pattern. Let me see what's in front of me. Just that one step. I don't know where it's going to end up or where it's going to lead to. But then comes the next, then the next. By that time, you've covered half the distance that you need yep. to, step by step. Um, and that self-belief, is it's a hard, hard skill, that that. Having and that faith in you. You're going to have it knocked. Yeah, yeah. Repeatedly by your own family, actually. Let's be honest. No one's self-belief started out because they had no naysayers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've got no naysayers and you're not doing something right, that's how I say it. Or you're not taking risks. Yeah. Because everyone has someone in their life who would rather see you do the safe thing or the understood thing. And then I get very excited because I'm sure you tell your kids this, the world was created and everything was built around you by people no different and no smarter than you. Maybe they're luckier, maybe they worked harder, maybe they learned something differently, but it's all acquired. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes into the world knowing, knowing everything. Yep. anything actually. We all start in the same place. place. Yeah. And, and that to me is very liberating in a way because I'll come back to this slightly sad reality that I've lived in a war zone in my heart in any case for the last few years but I've always been and this is getting a little bit deep rather but I've always I think because I left things every loss is like a little death and death is loss there's so much loss in my early childhood that it kind of taught me to be quite hyper aware of the fact that this party one day is going to end mm-hmm and without getting morbid about mortality, you can't take any of this with you. No. And so at some point in my early teens, I think I just decided, screw it, I'm going to do things on my terms because I might as well. I might yeah. as well. Not, I don't want to live a version of someone else's life for me, even though I come from Eastern Europe where the pressure is huge, huge. enormous. Any immigrant will tell you this, especially in a new country, so much pressure for stability and doing the right thing and honoring your elders or their version of what your life should be that doesn't change whether you're a minority whether you're female whether you're you know male paling from Yale I'm sure men in this society get plenty of other pressures even if you look like you are in the majority or, or successful or you come from established family background mm. there are different pressures that never end but tuning that out, finding your own voice and saying risk is something that's just part of life, that's where I see the most exciting people starting stuff because they're not afraid of the risk itself. What is there to be afraid of? Literally, what is there to be afraid of? I I know you mentioned before this that you went on a lot of public speaking training and stuff <laughs> yeah. like that, but I don't think you'd ever tell. I I think you need to be more publicly speaking and inspiring a, a bunch of people. This, oh, I'm trying. It's this, really hard work. <laughs> it's much nicer speaking one to one. It's really hard work in front of others, isn't it? Babe? Yes. Yeah. I mean, and again, this is where we try to say we differ. It's, there's only so much you can say on a conference stage, but yeah. the level of depth when you talk about the emotion you felt at a time, the experience, yeah. or um, what went on but you don't get to, to talk about that no, that's quite and and that needs commending and acknowledging as well that there people see great companies like Xamna be created and stuff but they don't know what the the blood sweat and tears that have gone on in the background no do, no, do, do they need to mm. but some people who have that deep rooted passion for trying to build something need to know that it doesn't always come easy okay mm. you know there's a, a 0 0.011 chance it will be very easy very very not hard work will always persevere and there's a lot of groundwork that goes into this stuff mm. but um let's stay on the positive we're with zamna now we are venture backed we're not a startup anymore we're growing rapidly you have some major clients around the world and now you're in sort of growth mode mm. where do you see yourself going as as zamna what's next um where you know, you're, you've got an audience here telling you, and you they now they know what Zamna does. Yeah, it's you putting you out there. How do you grow Zamna now? What's next? And do you just go beyond the the privacy and the the, the sort of uh, documentation phase? Is there more that you grow out to do? Is there a larger plan to this? I think the dream 
is to not spend the next 40 years going airline by airline. Um, because even though you can get early traction, early customers, a single airline, as you'll know, becoming your customer will take half a decade. Easily, <laughs> really quite easily. You'll do discovery, you'll do different agencies, you'll cover off different teams, you'll do free pilots, which is what we used to offer. We no longer offer free pilots, for example, they're all paid. Because we now have product market fit, we don't need to prove our concept. Mm -hmm. We just need to establish for any given airline client what benefit and value we create for them. So it's very different from a full service carrier to an ultra low cost, and we have clients in both categories. So the word of the year for Zamna in 24 is distribution. We are actively engaging with partners who help us leverage what we've done at individual airlines level in a bigger scale. Because there's a huge benefit to realizing in the industry, and this is true for anyone starting anything, once you've got initial proof points, start leveraging partnerships in a strategic way for your go-to-market, your delivery, your implementations, because chances are someone else is already serving your clients. And not only can you piggyback on that, but you know, one plus one equals three. You can have a strategic partnerships. We're having very, very interesting developments this year that I'm really looking forward to sharing when I can. But ultimately, it's just taking what you've built and going into spaces where there's already distribution or access or an established lot of players where you can add value, but they can help you grow. If we put our ego hats on and go, we'll do it on ourselves, which a lot of people in the industry like to do. Airline industry is full of people who think, oh, we'll just do it. We'll just do it ourselves. We don't need X, Y, Z, or we don't need to partner then the ego will get in the way of progress and growth. Well, I, th I, yeah, I think you're completely right on that one. It is having a focus. Yeah. So being focused in that year. And, and like you said, airlines take a very long time. <laughs> it's right? And it's hard to go global yeah. all at once. Yeah. And this is stuff that takes time because you're dealing with government, like I was saying, multiple multiple agencies and, 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 and interactions. You're dealing with safety, risk, compliance, all that sort of yeah. that, that boring Enterprise but important sales, stuff. right? Enterprise sales for a startup is like a killer. You should yeah. never do a startup that wants to sell to enterprise. But if you do, find your distribution partners, find your multipliers. That's the key for us this year. Uh, uh, well, I mean, that's amazing. And, and so what, but what are next? Do you still, after this, do you just see yourself in this space being that one cog or do you see yourself growing further do you need wider adoption of the technology that you're using in, in different use cases to get the to get the buy-in to what you're doing do you is there other value that you can you also add in other elements because mm. you've tinkered with a lot yeah and and you discover new things yep. all the time in this space or are you just sort of <sighs> i'm set in i'm set at home knowing this is what we need to master yeah and get a hold of and then we go from there Raza, I used to think that we wanted to be the end-to-end -end solution, including hardware, biometrics, the work that we did in Dubai when we met your brother was all about doing some of the work before business passengers would go through a biometric tunnel so that they wouldn't need to give their passport to anyone. And I now realize that this industry in particular forces focus. We have to go from, now you're scanning documents, now what? oh, you're scanning documents and you've got the travel context and travel rules? Well, then maybe you want to move into other things like biometrics or persistence of data so that you don't rescan and repeat the work. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that, oh, you might want to move into something to do with your DCS. So all of the step-by-step -step focus is because the airlines run on such a legacy lot of systems and actually because every airline uses as DCS in a unique way, we um, we were very naive in the beginning and we thought we could be this brilliant experiential thing for passengers having a super smooth check-in, none at all, journey and experience focus. And we won some clients with customer budgets. Um, but our best, best impact since COVID has been focused on operations. Our budgets have been coming out of operational and IT teams, as you well know. And that is because this pinch point, that problem, of making operations faster, better, cheaper is what every airline needs since COVID. They're operating like startups now. Yeah. They're cash strapped and your operation is expensive. So focusing on the taking the manual process out, digitizing the documents, you're scanning already, great, now what? Apply the travel rules, 
update the DCS, then, then think of biometrics, everything else, in that order. That's the focus we've been forced into by our clients, and we're following where they're leading. That's amazing. I mean, that that refocus, like you said, and, yeah. and you know, you never let a good crisis go to waste, as, it's very as, true. as, as it says, and that sort of resets the mind, refocuses, yeah. but it also brought great acceleration in terms of digitalizing. Now mm. it's just how do you go ramp from that? Mm. The challenge is, is, as airlines, we don't fall into the, the legacy again, the safety net. Yep. We continue churning it, but we need people like you constantly challenging us. And this is what the message is about. And I hope that's gone out. Um, but let's now, far away from Zamna, you've encapsulated this audience. I'm thinking my editing team is having a field day <laughs> with this content. Hi, Jamie. Uh, we're going to see that. Yeah. Um, but what's... So I want to talk about a couple of things, mm. right? And, and I know we've swayed slightly off, but mm. we've talked a lot about our, our kids beforehand and, mm -hmm. and things like that. There is, you talked about the upbringing you had, mm. a lot of moving around and, and things like that. You've similarly gone on journeys and brought your kids along to sort mm. of tackle that, but they're moving around. They have a little bit more stability. Do they see their, their mum or is she in, always in the office running this company, creating it? Is there stuff that you've learned that you've embedded to sort of create create a limit? How is it being a female founder with mm. young children? Mm. What sacrifices do you have to give? What sacrifices are you giving from the normal so you, to make sure that you're there for your children? Mm. I think so many people would love to hear mm. what is that? What does that look like? Mm. It's a really valid human point because as a mom, I actually get judged a lot more than my husband when I go away. So to you know do some work abroad I will be asked well, who's with the children yeah. and I smile very politely and I'll say to either the journalists or the people interviewing me would you ask a man the same question <laughs> why children from. are very happy with their father who's brilliant but ultimately you know you're right in that with young children whether you're a man or a woman a mum or a dad since Covid I think we have the luxury of a lot more balance provided of course you're not working for one of the companies who are forcing everyone back into the office and COVID actually helped I think all of us realize that we have lives outside of work pets children it's more acceptable to actually have a yeah. personal life and responsibilities that are to do with your little people or your furry people and um, I really do take advantage of it we no longer have an office for Zamna that's stationary we have a roaming office a lot of people are now remote or have moved out of London myself included because we don't have to all be in one space we never knew any different before Covid and that work from home actually means I see my two younger children who you know the newborn baby who's six months and the two, two year old more during the day I'll have lunch with them and I'll see them in the morning I'll see them you know in between calls that I have to make then I saw my three older daughters growing up when I wouldn't make it home for bedtime and I wouldn't see them Monday to Friday very well. And mm. that was really soul destroying. I remember trying to get out of our office in Hammersmith, which I think you and your colleagues have been to. And I was desperate to come back for bedtime and I just couldn't because, you know, physically you cannot leave until you're done with yeah, certain yeah. things. So I really credit work from home to create the balance that we now have. I don't know if I'd had if I would have chosen to have two extra children if I didn't have work from home, if I was in the office. Um, thankfully, that's not a choice that I'm facing. And I know I'm privileged in that I can figure out my own hours and my own balance with my team as CEO. But I also offer this to all of my team. We have a policy at Zamna, which is work from anywhere as long as you like. Uh, we also have a policy pretty much, you know, um, name your own hours. There are core hours that the team interacts on. But, you know, we have people in different time zones. We at one point had... Brazil, Canada, Romania, Ukraine, England, and then New Zealand. And all of that <laughs> means that we had very early stand-ups sometimes for our... Team meeting, though. For our, well, we had two stand-ups at one point. We had the morning one and then the evening one. Depending on people's time zones, you make it work very collaboratively. So that's one half of the answer. And then a very personal answer with... I, I won't get emotional about it, but it means so much to me to be able to say this. I owe so much to my husband for being the incredible human being, father and husband that he is, because he does more than me, objectively, every single day. I am privileged enough not to know what size nappies my two younger children wear. 
my husband deals with that because he is an all-in father. Amazing. We are past the age of dads who babysit their kids. Mm. I don't believe this is happening with our generation at all. The previous generation, yes. This generation of parents, husbands and fathers is phenomenal. And credit where credit is due, I have been married before. This is my second marriage and I got it really wrong the first time. Um, I was very naive and very in love and I made bad decisions. But there's an old Jewish joke. How do you make good decisions? A lot of bad decisions. And that's kind of the learning that we we brought into this marriage. I'm his second relationship as well. Um, and I, I do think if you're an ambitious female founder, particularly because we get very vulnerable when we have our babies and we do need time out to a large degree and we we pay the price of physically having children, I would say this, as a female CEO or a female founder, you either need a super supportive all-in partner or none at all. And I had I did it both ways. When I started Zamna, I had no one. Mm. I was a single mom. It was extremely hard, but it was better than my situation before where I was in a relationship that wasn't supportive of my ambition, my goals, my working ethic, and my, you know, ambition for myself as well to realize myself in a certain way so yeah good um good two things that happened is work from home uh, and the flexibility that's acceptable now and a super supportive partner or none at all (laughs) that's that's what i'd say those two things are the main drivers of why i can balance things well that's amazing and and i think it's you know a big shout out to to those partners you know (laughs) we stand on the shoulders of giants exactly they are (laughs) Uh, a backbone for for those trying to take that leech front you're, you're doing it for each other you are and sometimes you realize that um this person needs just that moral support i will handle this part and there will come a time where that, that role swaps you know where you take a back seat and then they get to do what they want and rather uh, risk we were talking about risk yeah. in our marriage we cannot have both people taking on an enormous yeah, the, just like risk. a business you don't have there's only so much risk tolerance you're allowed to take yeah as and it's as a team you have to hedge your bets a little bit so if you're a founder doing something super risky you might need to be with somebody who is doing something less risky my husband happens to be a phenomenal entrepreneur himself and built his own business unit and done an insane amount of innovation and challenge in his own industry and built a successful business in that space but the risk profile is much much lower and different to a tech startup venture back business which is a lot more aggressive and difficult and very much you know nine out of ten venture startups fail yeah something as high as that now that we're going into our 10th year i'm thinking right that's 10 years that we haven't failed so we we haven't succeeded big time yet in my view that's still there's still more to go it's slow and steady, but, but the fact that we haven't failed for 10 years over that puts us in you know the survival percentage of like a cockroach which <laughs> i really like one of our investors said forget unicorns build a cockroach we want a survival sort of startup <laughs> especially after covid and tech that was a nuclear winter for yeah, us that was <laughs> we survived was. it we cockroached through it <laughs> be the cockroach not the unicorn <laughs> that's the advice much. today <laughs> Oh God, that's a horrible quote. I'll <laughs> no, take it. I'll take I'm it. I'm clipping it now. I'm clipping it. Oh, oh God, this, uh, you heard it here first on Ross's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been amazing. I've I've loved this chat. This has probably been my favorite oh, so far, you. just because of just the depth that we've gone into. I mean, yeah, we don't know, do shallow, do we? We don't. No, <laughs> we've had we've had we've had brief tears. We've had you know uh childhood traumas and and you know we've had you know the the reality of the world that we live in that is mm. you know full of challenges and and war and you know not the nicest environments mm. but you know we take it in our stride we do what we can we we give back where we can in every way we can we support others and that's why we're here and that's why we're sharing this that we're a, we're all a human race we're all a community we're all here it's a better world if we help each other rather than being individual and not sharing. So I encourage that. But uh, Ira, we're going to take two minutes to to breathe, mm-hmm. recoup, and we're going to move on to our revered uh, rapid fire round. So I'll be giving you some some <laughs> quick questions. I did not questions. know this was coming. I've sprung it on you. <laughs> uh, if you watched all the episodes, you'll realize right at the end there is this. Oh, um, God. It is airline related, travel right. related. Okay, it will okay. be one wordish answers, and then we'll go on from there. That might be slightly <laughs> bigger, but and then it will go into opinionated answers. So uh, whenever you're ready, All right. um, we'll kick off. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. 
Just needs your quick quick response. Okay. Nothing controversial. Nothing okay. uh, too dangerous. But uh, okay, yeah, let's, let's go on from there. Um, chicken or beef? I'm vegetarian. <laughs> You're the first one who said it then. So vegetarian. Yeah, vegetarian. Aisle or window? Oh, window, just fun. Early lounger or late dasher? Total late dasher. Never leave a margin for error. Always challenge yourself to see if you're good enough to make it on time. <laughs> Favourite aircraft type? Ooh, the Neo. Very, very, very smooth. Favourite airline? Oh, that's just harsh. <laughs> um, Favourite airline? You can plead the fifth. It's okay. I, I, I'm going to plead the fifth. <laughs> I can't choose. Too many clients might be watching this. One thing overrated about travel? Mm. It's a really good one. <sighs> to some degree, I want to say lounges. <laughs> I'm so sorry to any lounges that actually make an effort. But when they're good, they're really, really good. The 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 sort of movies like Up in the Air, glorifying the lounge experiences, I think are so <laughs> devoid of reality where you might go to a lounge in between meal services when there's just dry bread and water on offer with some coffee and it's as busy and loud as anywhere else. Um, I, I think, yeah, lounges are good if they're solid and if they're loved and a lot of effort go goes in them. Otherwise, save your cash. Just don't bother. One underrated thing about travel. The ability to really get a phenomenal travel experience if you know how to gamify travel points and figure out the best combination of credit cards or systems and loyalty programs. That is massively underrated. I went away for my birthday on flights on our favorite airline that were worth 6,000 and I paid 400. Wow. By gamifying point hacking. different different vouchers. Yep, if you don't follow the points guy, follow the points guy. Um, just it's so underrated. You can really create travel experiences out of this world if you can figure out how to gamify vouchers, points and loyalty programs. Really worth it. One interesting fact that we haven't covered today about you. Um, I have the dubious privilege of having starred in a reality show about fashion <laughs> in my previous life as a fashion model <laughs> Wow! under thankfully a different name so no one can google this <laughs> yeah that was an experience it was very early days of reality tv when the first season of made in chelsea was filmed oh wow yeah we were filmed by the same crew and thank God we did not get renewed <laughs> and they did I think my career in life might have been very different <laughs> oh brilliant one bit of advice you'd give to your younger self looking back now looking back now it wouldn't be any different than the advice I give myself my children today it's going to be okay in the end if it's not okay it's not the end keep going <laughs> Just keep going. If you were on a six hour flight mm -hmm. or eight hour flight, long haul, mm -hmm. you had an empty seat next to you and you can pick anyone in the world, previous or current, mm -hmm. to sit next to you to have a chat, who would it be and why? One of the early female historical figures, uh, I don't want to say Emmeline Pankhurst because we know what the suffragettes were about. But somebody less known, like the um, one of the women in Hidden Figures, if you've seen that movie, the um, the women of color who were at NASA, who were actually never celebrated, never known about until well after the 60s launches that were actually credited to male pale and from Yale. I would love to know what it what it took for the previous generation of women to do very male focused jobs and to succeed in those very scientific spaces, which is what I'm now familiar with, but in a very different context. Amazing. Mm. And what is your favorite in 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 flight pastime? Are you an IFE person? Are you do you read a book? Um, love a bit of IFE, especially if the movies have not been released yet in cinemas. 
um <laughs> actually if i travel with my family we end up messaging between the seats <laughs> because we are such a large family we're now a family of eight <laughs> we now end up sitting in different parts of the aircraft and we we end up sending stupid messages or playing games between seats well, you're not the new, new gen sinking movies at the same time i right? have totally done that with my husband three two one play I, I have totally done that but i love that during a flight you're more or less on offline even if there is onboard wi-fi i actually want onboard wi-fi to never happen because it's just the ultimate beautiful bubble of indulgence when nobody can reach you which if you're a leader or an individual with a full calendar or a parent, it's really quite rare. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I mean, I mean, loads of people feed that back and say, no, no, keep, keep calls off the plane. Don't exactly. do anything. Exactly. It's a nice escape. I, I believe that. Favourite holiday destination? <sighs> because I got engaged and married there, it's Ibiza. One of my children's middle name is version of the spelling of Ibiza as well the Spanish spelling of it it's a beautiful island that's so much more than the people (laughs) associate with it truly it has a special place in my heart for my whole family and I I think I'd like to end my days there if I'm lucky enough to live a very long life I'll end up living there at some point not just holidaying there amazing that's it. That's it for all, uh, the the quick fire rounds. So you got off. Uh, you got off right. You did well. Um, but Ira, again, thank you so much for taking the time out for doing this. I mean, it was a, a, a an amazing podcast. We've gone into such detail, and <laughs> I, I I am sure there will be such value delivered, and so many people will reach out, and and I can't wait for this to go live. So I was thank about you. to say, if somebody does want to reach out, this is going out on LinkedIn, right? This is going out on 100%. your platform. Your details will be in the description. Yeah. You can reach yeah. out to Ira personally just for advice, reaching out, and um, and obviously the details of Zamna definitely will be do. in the description. Yeah. So yeah. we definitely encourage that. And this is what it's all about. It's all about connections. So make that first step. Uh, if DMs anything. are open. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you again for viewing, listening and subscribing. If you haven't subscribed yet, so hit that subscribe button. It helps us out more than you know. So please do that. Thank you very much and see you next time. Thank you.